Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 100, which reads as follows. Saha sampi jeva ja anatta pada sanghita ekang atta padang seyo yang sutwa upasammati which means better um, well if there be you could say if you take a thousand words that are unconnected with the path with a meaningful path or the path of, of the path towards the goal a meaningful path, let's say. Ekang, ekang atapadang seyo. No. If one were to speak a thousand words, pada, right, that's what it is. Pada means words. A thousand words, useless words, anatta. If one were to speak a thousand useless words, ekang atapadang seyo. One word that is meaningful, atta. One word that is meaningful is better. Yang sutwa upasamati. When one hear, when having heard it, one becomes peaceful. A single word is better than a thousand words. If the word, uh, if that one word, leads one to peace. So this was taught. In, it's a very interesting story, actually. There was a group of 500 thieves, bandits, in the time of the Buddha, when the Buddha was stay, staying in Vailavana, which would have been in Rajagaha. Uh, Rajagaha was a city that was surrounded by mountains, and so up in the mountains, back in the Buddha's time, there were bandits. Apparently, even today, in this well, in the last century, they've had problems with bandits as well, as it became a Buddhist, um, uh, a Buddhist tourist site. Uh, it's it's become a popular place for bandits, and there was a story some years back about a, a Buddhist monk who went with uh, another man on a pilgrimage to all the holy sites, and they were camping up on the in the mountains above Rajagaha. And sure enough, a group of bandits came and robbed them of everything, including the monk's robes. So he was left with a single robe, and they took the, cam the man's camera and all their money and left them with, with nothing. So it's not surprising that 2,500 years ago there were bandits as well. And they did all sorts of evil, nasty things. And one day, a certain man who uh, we don't know his history, and it would be actually quite interesting to know his history because the story is all about him. But he shows up with scars covering his body, so he's seen a lot of... Um, he's obviously had his share of, of conflict, covered in scars. And he has to join this band of 500, or this large band of bandits. And the leader took one look at him, and thought this guy's trouble. You know, this is the kind of guy who would kill his own mother and eat her flesh, or kill his own father and drink his blood. So he says, would cut off the breast of his mother and eat it, or draw blood from the throat of his father and drink it. That's what the commentary says. And so he says, "Sorry, you're you're too evil even for us." Uh, now he it, it, it's it's it has to be said that he doesn't have any proof of that, and he may be wrong. We can't take his word for that, and there's a reason for us not necessarily taking his word for that. But it does seem that there may be something to it because uh, he goes to having been rejected. He goes to one of the sort of second in command in the in the, or one of the higher up followers of this group of bandits, and makes friends with him and uh, sort of ingratiates himself with this man and as a result is taken in and somehow persuaded he, he, he manages to use this leverage to persuade 
the head of the bandits to let him stay. So he gets to stay with these bandits and they do all sorts of evil stuff together. And then it happens that people in the city of Rajagha got fed up and the king gets fed up and so they band together and they um, go out and capture all of these bandits. They manage to capture this large number of, of bandits and bring them before the king and bring them before the courts and they are sentenced to death. Now the problem is nobody wants to kill these guys. You know, there's a lot of Buddhists around, and Buddhism has been heavily influenced the thought, and probably Jainism has heavily influenced people's thoughts, and there's a lot of talk about non-violence, so nobody wants to do the killing. They all want, they're happy to, or they, they have come to the decision that they have to kill these guys. Not a very Buddhist decision, but it's understandable in a worldly sense that uh, there's not much else they can do. They don't have a way to keep them in prison, I guess, and rehabilitation. You know, probably they should have taken the Buddha's lead and made them all monks and forced them to practice meditation. That would probably sobered them up. But they didn't do that. Instead, they sentenced them to death. And they could, but they couldn't find anyone to execute them. So they thought, well, what are we going to do? Well, they came up with an idea. They would have the head of the bandits kill them. You know, we'll we'll let you. I think they give him a a bargain. You no. Know? Something like they'll, they'll uh, maybe let him live, I don't know. Yeah, we will spare you and give you riches if you kill all of your followers. Now, the head of the bandits couldn't do this. He was actually a fairly principled evil bandit uh, in that he couldn't kill his men. He was loyal to them. And in fact, none of the bandits felt capable of doing it. So they, they put this to all of them. And they say, you know, any of you will set, you, you will be free if you just do the duty of killing all of your fellows. And none of them would do it. Except, and you guessed it, they came to this scarred, uh, they say copper-toothed. Somehow he had copper teeth. Copper-colored teeth, probably from chewing too much tobacco or betel leaves or betel fruit or whatever. Uh, and they came to him and asked him, and he said, Okay, sure. Sounds good to me. I don't want to die. So yeah, not a very principled person, it seems. He had this uh, sense, he had no sense of loyalty even, or a sense of fear of killing. And so he killed them. He was a fairly strong man and so chopped off each of their heads. Maybe it wasn't 500, but it was a large number. And they gave him some wealth and put, sent him on his way. And meanwhile, the people of the city were, were kind of happy because they'd gotten rid of this large group of bandits, but unfortunately there were other bandits in the area. A common thing in Bihar, even today, is, is known for its lawlessness. I think it's gotten better, actually. We were there last year, and it was actually quite amazing that the roads have improved in the, in the olden days. Well, the olden days, just some years ago, the roads in Bihar had puddles a foot deep or two feet deep. And, every, and the, the roads were in total disrepair. But now they have a highway from Kusinara to, to well, all the way to Bodh Gaya, actually, and on to Patna and, and, and then to Bodh Gaya, which was, uh, was a real joy to go on a pilgrimage this year. So, um, it, but it has that reputation, even in the last century. So in the Buddha's time, it was, I guess, a lawless sort of place and lots of bandits. And so they thought, well, we were successful the first time, let's go out and capture us some more bandits. So indeed, they went out and captured another group of bandits. These bandits were in the east, probably close to Raj, to Vulture's Peak, or no, that would be in the south, I guess, but uh, somewhere in the east. And so then now they went to the north, and they, they rooted out all the bandits, and they gathered up another large group of bandits brought them to the city, and again they had the same problem. Nobody was going to kill them. And they asked all the bandits, and none of them would do it. Great, well this group doesn't have an unscrupulous person. What are we going to do? And then someone thought, well, what about that last guy? Maybe he'd do it. 
Mm, we could give him lots of wealth and, and uh, you know, reward him for it. And so they went and knocked on his door and sure enough he said, well, yes, I'll do it if you pay me. And so he came up and chopped off another large group of bandits' heads. So he's accumulating a lot of problematic deeds, it seems. And likewise, the, 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 again, people being bolstered by their success, the populace decided that it would continue this law, lawful pursuit of justice uh, of a sort. Kind of a brutal form of justice, actually. But they, would, they decided to pursue it. And so they went to the West, and they cleared out all the bandits in the West and brought them back. And again, they well, let's get this guy out, he seems capable, and so they got the same guy to kill all these bandits, and they did the same with all the bandits in the south. And so they pretty much cleared up all the large group of, groups of bandits. Of course, bandits are, I guess, something that, that, that are in constant production in, in, uh, throughout the world. So, probably because we're not really taking care of poor people. You know, the Buddha said that pointed out that this is one of the main reasons why um, crime exists, is because of poverty. I mean, it doesn't take the Buddha to say it, it's actually not, not that hard to understand. So there's something wrong with the, this, this must have been something wrong with this uh, city. Perhaps this was after Bimbisara was killed and this was his, under his son, who was not a very good king. Uh, but it doesn't say that this was even in Rajagaha, so I'm actually not sure. Yeah, it may not have even been in Rajagaha. I have to research that, but it doesn't. I don't think it says. Uh, and so anyway, then they had more bandits that they had to. They, they realized there were always going to be bandits, and whenever they captured a bandit, they knew that they needed someone to chop off his head because I guess that's all they could figure to do with them. Uh, and so they they got together and they they asked the king or they talked about it together. Why don't we have this guy? take this on as his, his job, you know. We'll just call him the executioner. And indeed, that's what they did. And so, from that point on, it says he spent 55 years doing just that, killing people. And until finally, he got old, and it says that he could no longer cut off someone's head with one blow. He was still willing to do it, but it would have to take two or three blows to actually cut someone's head off. And yeah, that sort of got unpalatable to the populace. They were fine with cutting people's heads off when it seemed kind of more or less, uh, well, minimally painful. But now it was a bit too hard for most people to stomach, and so they decided, well, that's probably not a good thing to have somebody's head half cut off and have them screaming and... You know, wait, wait, I'll get it done. Chop, chop, chop. Not really a good scene. So they decided, probably we should find a new executioner and we'll let this guy retire. And so indeed, they relieved him of his post. And I would think it was actually fine by this guy because at this point, well, he, he was ready for retirement. He had fulfilled his duty as executioner. Uh, but it says it says something actually interesting, and I think the English translation gets it wrong. So I'm I'm working with both the Pali and the English. But in the English, it says that uh, he when he was executioner, he always got to wear old clothes uh, and have uh, milk milk rice or milk porridge and flowers and w uh, wear flowers like garlands of flowers and uh, you know, and perfumes. But I don't think that's correct, because first of all, the Pali doesn't support it, and second of all, the text doesn't support it. The Pali says uh, not, he wasn't able to, let me see, Kirgaki, Yeah, it says, Imani Chattari Nalabhi, which means he, he didn't get these. 
Now it's curious that he wouldn't get them when he was an executioner, so I think that's why the English translation messed it up, but I'm pretty sure they messed it up, because it's pretty clear that no, he didn't get them as an executioner. Uh, you could speculate why that is, maybe there were some regulations. Well, if you're going to be killing people, you have to avoid certain things. Like he couldn't wear, he had to, you could imagine he would have to uh, look the part and smell the part. So wearing flowers, probably not a thing for an executioner to do, and being perfumed, also probably not a thing. And wearing old clothes, so he probably had to always be wearing the clothes of an executioner. Maybe he had an executioner's hood like they did in the Middle Ages in Europe. Either way, it appears that, appears that not, not Labi, he didn't gain those. And so, and that's how it, it makes sense in the story, because once he retired, he was free to do these. He, he could put on his old comfortable clothes and he could eat whatever he wanted. Somehow uh, it was important as an executioner that he didn't eat these, these uh, rice porridge or milk porridge with ghee. Uh, maybe he had to stay thin or something, or maybe it would had to do something, I don't know. But now he could have it, and he was really excited, and so he put on flower garlands, which was, I guess, a thing, and, uh, and he, he put on perfumes and, and sort of decked himself out uh, as he was wont to, to do, sort of in a festive state. And it, this was like his beginning of his retirement. And so he set this all out, set out the, the rice porridge, and he was just going to get ready to eat. And then who should show up? but Sariputta. And Sariputta had done something similar to what the Buddha would do, and that is he had reflected on who would benefit from his teachings and from his presence that day. And maybe he had heard through the grapevine, if you want to avoid any kind of supernatural cause, then maybe he just heard or knew, because it would have been news that this guy had retired and so on, but I'm pretty sure the text says that he was able to assess with magical, with mental power. He was able to, he and he he surveyed. No, it actually. Well, it looks like yeah, it looks like he did use magic to to gain it. But you could. It doesn't actually say that. It says he looked over his alms round and saw the milk rice in the in this man's house. So if you want to. And it's true that often the commentary seems to be, um, what do you say, uh, exaggerating, embellishing these stories. So it could just be an embellishment. Sorry, Buddha may not have used magical powers. He may have just known that this guy was going to have milk rice because for some reason the execution, as an executioner he couldn't. And so he thought, well, now that he's gone back to his life, you know, it would really benefit him if I were to go because if he, if he gives me some of that milk rice, it'll probably mitigate some of the evil deeds that he's done. That was sort of the thinking. So Sariputta went to this man's house, shows up, and curiously, the man is overjoyed. Which isn't, isn't the sort of behavior you'd expect from a murderer, a mass murderer, someone who has killed about, uh, over 2,000 people, more than, you know, thousands of people, uh, in his 55 years as an executioner. But yet, he was overjoyed and, and thought, you know, this is another thing that I haven't been able to do for 55 years. I've never had this opportunity to give alms, and yet here I have this meal in front of me. And so he invited the elder in without a, without a second thought and gave him milk rice to eat and asked the elder to sit down. And we have a couple of curious things happen here that um, will be interesting to talk about when we, when we well, interesting in, in regards to how this, uh, what this teaches us. The first one is that the Sar Sariputta noticed that as he was eating, the, lay, the, the man was quite agitated. He was actually suffering, appeared to be distressed. And so he put to realize it's because, you know, he really w was looking forward to eating some of this rice porridge. And this is another reason why it can't be a, the way the English translates it, because if he'd, been, if he'd gotten it, it says he hadn't eaten rice porridge for a long time, so clearly uh, for the 55 years that's what it's talking about, because this is the first day in a long time he would have been able to eat it. Uh, and so Sariputta says, well, why don't you sit down and eat as well? 
which the Buddha has done this as well, I think, in the Dhammapada. Uh, we'll get to a verse where the Buddha does this, where there's a man who's very hungry, and he, he, so he can't listen to what the Buddha is saying because he hasn't eaten. And, so before, and there's a whole group of people in front, but the Buddha uh, thinks about that man and tells the monks to feed him. You know, says to the monks, you know, can you give some, this man some of your extra alms food? And so there's an inter just an interesting point that food can play a part and your, your physical well-being can play a part in your ability to, to practice, your ability to do wholesome things. You know? If you're very, very hungry yourself, sometimes it's hard to give a gift. It's hard to be... Uh, hard, especially for, a, for someone who's not accustomed to it. It's hard to do good deeds. So, the, so Sariputta rightfully, I think, said, you know, why don't you sit down and eat with me? It's another proof that all of this talk about how you have to let the monks eat first, the lay people shouldn't eat when the monks are eating, it's really not supported by the text. It's another example how we kind of sometimes go overboard with our culture. On the other hand, you could also ar you could argue rather that uh, this, was an, this was extenuating circumstances and maybe there is something to the culture of letting monks eat first when you invite them. It seems to have been the culture in that time. This man uh, would have been following culture, saying, you know, I'll let the monk eat first. But then Sariputta was fine with it, and I think reasonably so, letting him eat as well. He was hungry, and he really wanted some of this uh, milk rice. And so they sat down and eat, and after they had finished eating, Sariputta began to uh, give thanks. And the way of giving thanks, of course, is it's called anumodana, which means appreciating. So you, you, modana means joy. Um, so it's, and anu means in regards to or towards something. So it means in regards to, in relation to the, the gift, you express your appreciation of it, or you express your happy, you, 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 you have sympathetic or altruistic joy. You feel happy for the person. That's what it means. Anumodana means I'm happy for you, or happiness for your deed. Your deed makes me happy. So, um, how it was accomplished by Buddhist monks is they would use it as a means to teach the benefits of giving and also the benefits of other things, like how to practice for someone who is of a mind to be generous and charitable, what's the, what are the next steps? How should they use that? And what are things that will bring them uh, the goal of, of, of happiness? You know, from, because when we give charity, it's because we want to be happy. It's because we want to be a good person. So how do you accomplish these things, to be happy and be a good person? So it extends, of course, into meditation and morality and that kind of thing. But when Sariputta began to talk, we have another curious event. Again, he was not able to pay attention. This man was again distracted and distraught. And so Sariputta, sensing this, stopped uh, teaching and asked him, what's wrong? You know, why aren't you able to listen? Are you able to focus? Are you, why are you not able to focus on what I'm saying? And what happened was, as Sariputta started talking about good things, maybe not even touching upon a relevant, uh, related topic, just the whole idea of spiritual embitterment, uh, of course, was difficult for this guy to, to hear, because immediately his mind went back to all the evil that he had done, uh, all, the, all the crime he had committed as a, as a bandit, and moreover, all the evil deeds that he had done every time he killed uh, a person. And so he said, for 55 years I've done nothing but killed people. And he says, I, I, I just, I can't, I can't focus my mind, I can't calm my mind. I'm not able, I can't even, you know, I, I can't fix my mind on what you're saying. I, my mind is, is, uh, is distraught, is overwhelmed by the memories of bad deeds, which actually is common when you do good deeds. It's common for you to, for them to come in conflict with the evil deeds in your mind. And so they, they become more glaring 
Whereas ordinarily you wouldn't even think of all the bad things you've done. But when you undertake to do good deeds, suddenly they become more apparent to you. And you find that you have to face them. So that's what he was struggling with. Sariputta did something, another interesting thing about this story, Sariputta did something that uh, you won't find that often. And I think that you have to be careful to see precisely what Sariputta did and not go beyond it. Sariputta said, I, I think I'll trick him. And it's important to note that there is a difference, a categorical difference between actually lying to someone and tricking them misleading them. It seems, and I think it's reasonable to suggest, but something that's not obvious, that tricking people can be wholesome. I mean, it seems reasonable to me, not only because this story is an example of it, but there seems to be reasons why you might want to trick something. The reason why lying to someone is categorically different is because you've committed yourself. If I let's let's look at what Sariputta did and show and then we can talk about the difference. Sariputta says to him, "Well, did you did you kill of your own uh, free will or were you made to do it by others?" And he, and he says, "Well, the king made me do it, reverend sir." And then the Sariputta asks him, he says, "Well, well, if that's the case, what did you do wrong?" And the the man was was sort of shocked by this. And he said, well, according to, he thought to himself, according to what the elder says, I have done no wrong, which isn't what Sariputta said. So he really did trick him. He tricked him into believing that. And this is what is called in Mahayana, kusala, kusala upaya, which means skillful means. Upaya means a means, and kusala is, is wholesome or skillful. But the, the implication is you can do an evil deed for a good purpose. You can do something that's immoral, if the, result, if the ends justify it. That's often used to justify unwholesome deeds. Now, the point is, Sariputta never said, is, you know, killing for someone else is, 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 is blameless. And that's not the case. You know, if you kill, it's mitigated by the fact that you're doing it at, some, at the behest of someone else. We call it sasankarika. Sasankarika means prompted. So that would be, I think, a case of a sasankarika mind. Uh, the, the mind, the intention to kill, is prompted. In other words, you wouldn't have done it yourself. You had no desire to kill. You had, had not so much hate for the person that you wanted to kill. But um, having been prompted, you cultivate the unwholesome mind. Yes, I'm going to kill this person, deprive them of life, hurt them, and, and, you know, and, and just all around do something that they don't want me to do. So still evil, but generally considered to be less karmically potent. So there is something to it. Sorry, Buddha wasn't, wasn't tricking him completely, but he tricked him into thinking that there was no evil involved. Now the reason why it would be different, you can just, just from a practical point of view, if this guy ever came back to Sari Buddha and said, hey, I went to the Buddha and, and he, said, You're, he, said, he said there is evil involved, or I went and I talked to the monks and they said, what, of course killing is evil, it doesn't matter whether you... And it doesn't, doesn't absolve you from evil just because someone told you to do it. Well, Sariputta could say, well, I, I was just asking you a question. I never... And the man could get angry, well, you tricked me. And he's, and then, but then Sariputta could say, well, I tricked you, you know, for a good purpose. And indeed, there was a good result from it. But it's different when you actually lie because then people can't trust your word. If Sariputta had said, you've done nothing wrong, you know, it's categorically different than him tricking no, tricking is tricky. It's not perfectly pure necessarily, although we want to say it's pure because Sariputta didn't have bad intentions and couldn't have given rise to an unwholesome mind, it seems. Again, this is just a story, so it might not be true, but it, it, I think it's reasonable. It's anyway, definitely, in my mind, there's no question that it's different from actually telling a lie because then you've, you've committed yourself to this is true. Yeah, this is the way it is. So, something to keep in mind. That uh, I, I talked to, um, there was another case in modern times where this came up. Um, what is, there's this, um, there's this story, this quandary, this dilemma of 
a monk and uh, no, of, of a, a monk who sees something and th so the, suppose you have someone one person kills another person and there's a monk sitting nearby and he sees the whole thing uh, so then apparently what I, I was reading in a book I think it was, this was years ago I was reading in a book about this story and it said well what the monk should do is get up move about 10 feet and sit down again and then if someone comes and asks them did you see anything did you see who killed who did you see uh, what was what happened here the monk should say since I got to this place I haven't seen anything I haven't seen any such thing since the since the time in the time since I've been at this place because actually it's true because he moved 10 feet in the old place he saw something but in this place he didn't so again, a means of tricking, you know, of, of avoiding the truth uh, or deceiving someone, really, into believing that you're you know, believing something that's not true uh, without actually committing yourself or without actually crossing that line of uh, stating something that's not false. It's quite different, really, because then people can't trust your word. They can't, you know, they can't know whether there's actually truth in what you're saying. Whereas in this case, there is truth. It's just kind of mitigated. Now, I went to my teacher with this because this was kind of weird to me for another reason. I thought, well, why doesn't he just tell them? Why not? If someone killed someone else, why not just tell them? But apparently, especially in Thailand, it's a big thing for monks not to get involved with criminal affairs. Now, an argument could be made that if you help put someone behind bars, you're responsible for their suffering. You have a part in it. Not not completely convincing for someone who grew up in Western culture because we have a sense that, well, it's the best thing for this person to be put in jail. It's better that they're in jail than they're out doing all sorts of nasty deeds. So to some extent, we consider it to be a good thing. But that's an interesting argument that I don't really have an answer to. But anyway, I went to my teacher and he, he, he gave me even another option, which is to use the Thai. In Thai, it's, it's possible to just say, I don't see. Uh, and if you say, I don't see, my hin, my hin can be present or it can be past. So he said, if someone asks you if you've seen anything, you can just look around or you can, you can look and then say, my hin. Because my hin is, it's, it's just a, an abbreviated version of I don't see or I didn't see. It can mean, can mean either one. Uh, it, because the, the colloquial usage is just to say, don't see, not see, basically. And I was quite shocked at the time. I thought, well, why wouldn't you just tell them? But uh, it's a different argument. It's not relevant here exactly. But the point here is about deceiving. Uh, I thought that was kind of funny because uh, you can just, just say, well, I don't see, because what you mean is right now I don't see. You're not, you're, if you say, mahin, it means, oh, right now I don't see anything. I don't see anybody killing anyone now. But the person hearing it will assume that you meant it in the past. Again, being quite tricky. But, you know, coming from my teacher, especially, it, it, it offers some support there. But it makes sense, as I said. You could argue that there's something problematic and it's kind of tricky and it's not really ethical, some people would say. But um, I don't think you can argue that it's categorically the same as crossing that line of lying. So, anyway... Regardless, this is the story, this is as we have it. Make of what you, what you will, argue what you will. The result was actually quite amazing. Because he, he tricked this man, the man then became tranquil, was able to listen to Sariputta's talk, and somehow reached into the depths of his being and cultivated a wholesome mind. And it says something like, I'm not quite sure what it means, but it says he came to Anulomika Kanti. Anulomika Kanti would be the last of the vipassana jnanas. It's where your mind conforms. Anulomika means going with the grain. It has patience which conforms to the truth. Kanti means patience. So uh, what that means is when you conform to reality in the sense that you no longer have likes or dislikes. So he was able to come to this state of equanimity, uh, seeing things quite clearly, which is a very high state. 
and it says uh, sotapani sotapanamagasa urato orato no ora orato which means on this side of sotapana so he didn't become a sotapana sotapati magasa orato which means he didn't didn't become enlightened for good reason i mean he still got a lot of bad karma to atone for and and that's going to catch up with him and make him feel guilty in the end and then he's going to realize okay i did do some evil deeds i do have some some share of the karma for sure but for the time being he was actually quite uh, ecstatic and and uh, tranquil in mind and sariputta got up and left and this man um, you know, was just sort of ecstatic and oh and and went after him this is so the lay the layman followed Sariputta for some way uh, at least to the edge of the city maybe and then Sariputta took his bowl back so the man would have carried his bowl for him and when they got to the edge of the city Sariputta turned and took his bowl and wandered off into the forest maybe back to Velawana and the man turned around and promptly was gored by a cow and died. Now we have five people in the stories that were gored by a cow. And the commentary tells us that it was the same cow. It wasn't actually a cow. It was an, a demon of sorts. And there was this female demon who had, I think, been attacked by five different men in a past life. Maybe they had, like, like well, taken advantage of her. Yeah. It's something like that. There's some terrible, terrible story that this one woman had such evil done to her that in this final life, all five of them were gored. Bahia is one of them. I can't remember the other three. But there were five monks that were gored. Actually, maybe not five. I can't. I think so. But um, you know, someone who knows these things better than me could probably say. Anyway, point being, regardless of what you think of that little tidbit, he was killed, and that was it. So the monks, um, as they were wont to do, I got a bunch of gossiping monks here. Well, they sit around and talk about the Dhamma, so they were sitting around wondering about this man. They say, well, he for 55 years he did all these, all these evil deeds, but then Sariputta uh, went to his house and he was really actually a nice guy. He gave Sariputta rice milk and he listened to Sariputta's uh, milk rice and he listened to Sariputta's talk and he seemed to get it. He seemed to sort of calm down and gain some sort of insight into reality. That's what it seems. So they wondered. They said, I wonder where he was reborn. You know, where does such a person go? It's a good question. Now I think most people would say, well man, 55 years, that's that's a big deal. There's no way that that one day really mitigated much, if any, of the evil deeds that he had done. But the Buddha heard, heard them talking, came in and said, what are you guys talking about, as usual? And they told him, it seems to be a thing, you know, the Buddha would come in and he'd take it as an opportunity. Whatever they were talking about, he'd use that as a means to give them a teaching. So they told him what, he was talk what they were talking about, and the Buddha said, Oh, he was born. You want to know where he was born? He was born in Tusita. Tusita is one of the higher heavens. It's higher even than where Sakai lives. It's where the Buddha's mother, the Bodhisattva's mother, was reborn when she passed away. But they were shocked. They couldn't believe it. And they said, how could it be? He, he, sp he did so much wrong. And just one little bit of teaching from Sariputta. How could that one little bit of teaching have made such a profound change in him? How could it have affected him so so profoundly? And then we have this verse. This verse is the first verse in the Sahasavagga, the verse of thousands. So we're going to get a bunch of verses now regarding thousand this, thousand that. Um, but this one, he says that it doesn't matter if, the, if it's a if, if it's just one one word, it's better than a thousand words. It's just one little piece of truth that calms the mind, that tranquilizes the defilement, that clears the mind. It's better than any 
other, and is more powerful than a speech of a thousand words or a thousand sentences. And that's what he said in the verse. So that's the Dhammapada verse. How does it relate to our practice? Well, first of all, it means you shouldn't really spend all your time watching the hundreds and hundreds of videos that I have on YouTube or that other people have posted on YouTube. It means that lots and lots of words aren't necessarily a good thing. The more important is those words that actually help you, those words that actually benefit you. But moreover, I think that's perhaps being a little bit unfair. Moreover, um, such words that do help you, you know, are, are, are of immense value. Our, it's, their value is not to be underestimated. So the value of listening, the value of learning, the value of, of uh, studying the Dhamma cannot be undervalued. And if, if it does help you, if the teachings do encourage you in the practice and, and tranquilize, calm your mind down and uh, focus your mind on good things, then uh, that has to be an important part of our practice. You shouldn't think that I'm just going to figure it out on my own. It's very difficult. It's not something most of us are capable of. On the other hand, if you take a person's teachings and they work and they benefit you, especially when the, that person is a Buddha or someone who is passing on the Buddha's teaching, then don't underestimate that. There's greatness to it. And it also allows us to differentiate between those words that are useless. You know, words shouldn't just be pretty, they shouldn't just be uh, enjoyable, so it shouldn't just be a bunch of funny stories like this story about, it shouldn't just be a, a story that is entertaining. You, know, you have to ask yourself, what did it do for your mind? Did it help you? Did it make you a better person? Did it incline your mind towards good things? You know, I mean, you could even argue that there are some stories, non-Buddhist stories, that do incline your mind in a good way. But that's what's great about the Buddhist stories, because whether you believe them or not, almost all of them have a really a powerful message. You know, some of the messages people find hard to swallow, but I would say for the most part, if you read the Jatakas, if you read the Dhammapada, and if you're interested in good things, you can't help but, but feel warmed, feel, feel encouraged by these things. You know, these are stories of success. They're stories of change. They're stories of progress. They're stories of accomplishment, people accomplishing good deeds, doing good things for themselves and others. They're stories of learning. They're stories about enlightenment. They're not stories about you know, just murder and so on. You know, like the Thai version of Angulimala probably spends too much time on the murder. There's this great movie. It's really The end of it is really wonderful, but most of the movie is just a bunch of killings. So you've got all these combat scenes, and you kind of think, well, you know, I understand that they wanted to make it palatable to you know, people who like to see people kill people, but it's a bit over the top, and it makes you think, well, that's probably not something that's very useful. But if you fast forward through that and you just get to the end, or if you could just focus on the good bits, there's a great message to it. And that's the difference. You know, I think there are a lot of... I've heard about some, some uh, modern entertainment, like there's this... There was this one called Breaking Bad you know, that my family was watching, and I'm sure many of you have, I'm, I'm sure everyone's heard of this, and there's another one called Game of Thrones, and I, I, haven't wa I, don't, you know, I don't watch these things, but uh, as I understand, they are sort of glorifying evil. Now, maybe not glorifying, but it's all uh, what they would say, gray morality, which I think is quite dangerous. There's a problem there, and it somehow, the idea is to make it real and make it relatable, I guess. You know, I can relate with that person and how easy it would be to slip into evil. But uh, there's also the, you know, the danger of, of considering it to be proper or, or um, you know, ordinary or reasonable. And definitely, I think the potential for it to lead people to i don't know I mean, having not watched these things, I can't really say, but um, certainly not of any use that I can think of to watch such a thing. I mean 
to if you had a movie or like a movie like Angulimala or, or something that inspires you that is a story true or not true or not isn't fiction isn't the isn't the key determiner here true or not true isn't the point it's is does it have a message so the Buddha would tell stories and we have lots of stories so in that sense it's about the content it's about the nature now does it have and not all messages are equal you can't just for art, for art or film, or I think for the entertainment industry, it, it doesn't matter which message you're presenting, to, to some extent. It's just the idea of a, a novel message. So they ran out of good stories to tell, and now it's all about nuanced stories or, or outright bad stories, you know. And that is, well, I mean, that's the nature of, of samsara, but um, this is the question. Does it, does it lead to wholesome qualities in your mind, having watched it? Now, maybe it does. Maybe if you see someone totally corrupt their minds, like as I've talked about um, uh, crime and punishment. Now, crime and punishment is great because in the end there's a realization to some extent. It's also heavily steeped in Christianity, which is disappointing, but um, there's a real sense of crime and punishment whereas because uh, Hollywood or wherever can just come up with whatever story they want there's not necessarily that, that sense of retribution or that sense of the destruction of a person's mind a person can be an evil person and somehow be totally calm and cool as, cool as a cucumber about it now that can happen in real life but only on the superficial level you know, deep down there is uh, the mind that is set on evil is problematic and the, so the second thing that we have to ask about this story is what exactly it means whether it means that that evil that that man has done is actually wiped clean you know we talk about karma being sort of something that gets put in a bank somewhere and that's not actually the case either it's karma is something that affects you and it's something you remember so it's something that comes back to haunt you um, but it seems like it didn't come back to haunt this guy. It did for a bit, but then he o overcame it out of through deception. But I think so. I think to some extent that's true. That when you change your mind, mm -hmm. that like Angulimala is another example. When you change your mind, to some extent you don't have to pay. The uh, you know your karma can be mitigated to a great degree. I wouldn't say it can be usually completely. Uh, wiped out. Now with Angulimala there was a sense that it was all wiped out except for um, what he was set to experience in this life. So he did experience great suffering as a monk. People beat him and when he went into the village for alms they would attack him. This monk was gored to death so that's definitely not a good thing. But then he went to heaven. But I think telling is that he went to heaven. He didn't even become a Sotapanna. Now if he had been ready there's no reason why he shouldn't have become a Sotapanna except that he had done all these terrible deeds. And so there's a sense that it kept him back. So if you if you look at the, the, the practice of becoming a Sotapanna, it's such a great thing to listen to the Dhamma and to practice the Dhamma. And he was cultivating such powerful, wholesome minds, but they were, they were being uh, counteracted by the unwholesome minds. And so to some extent, they cancel each other out, and we're left with going to heaven. I would still argue that probably he's set for suffering. Uh, he's set probably not to last too long in heaven. Uh, probably after some not so long time, maybe oh, I don't know, a thousand years, a million years, I don't know, some short, you know, brief period of time, he'll be back down on earth and probably going to get in trouble again. Don't know. But uh, there's a sense that there's probably still residue uh, of 55 years of killing people. Now, mitigated by the fact that he wasn't actually doing it of his own free will exactly. I mean, he did actually agree to do it. But he was coerced, and he wasn't doing it because he wanted to kill. He was doing it as a job because other people wanted him to do it. Still bad, not good. Bad, 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 but not as bad as if he had a, a vendetta against these people or if he was cruel or a serial killer. Probably you could argue that some of the evil deeds he had done before he became executioner were worse. 
because they would have been really motivated by evil. But it's important. It's an important note that karma isn't something that goes into a bank. It's not something that you can add up and come up with an equation. It's very complicated, complex, and it's fluid, and it can change. Um, it's dependent very much on your mind. So his mind became pure, and then he died with a pure mind and went to heaven. It's likely that there's still some memories that are going to come back, or some aspects of the killing that affected him. But for the most part, as we'll hear from Angulimala later on, all what happened was there was a cancelling out. And when you do a, a very, very good deed, like listen to the Dhamma and, and cultivate wholesome minds, it can actually do away with a lot of the bad deeds, the residue of memory, the harmful memories, because you straighten your mind out, you, you get it you know, what we would wish of any convict, or any any uh, criminal is that they see the error of their ways I mean, in Buddhism there's no sense of retribution, oh this person did bad things, we should hurt them, we should punish them, we should put them in jail so it'll hurt them that's ridiculous, there's no reason for that I mean, I don't think anyone well, many people do, but I, I think it's terribly unreasonable to think that that would be even useful or, or, or moral. It's unethical. You know, two wrongs don't make a right. An eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. Actually, it was pointed out to me it leaves the whole world half blind because you're only losing one eye each. But, or no, someone else said that the last person wouldn't be blind because no, there would be no one to take out their eyes, take out their second eye, I guess. Uh, something like that. Anyway, the retribution uh, no, has no place. So if a person realizes the error of their ways, you consider that enough said, enough done. That's uh, the end of that. Uh, so, absolutely, uh, even intellectually it makes sense, but according to karma, it does seem to have some... some, uh, some uh, it, it does seem to work that way to some extent. So, anyway, I've talked for quite some time. Here we have the importance of good speech and sort of a sense of don't underestimate. It's not about quantity, it's about quality. It's really what this verse is saying. The importance of listening to the Dhamma can't be underrated. The importance of practicing, even for a short time. Buddha has said otherwise in other places. We shouldn't be discouraged by just a short meditation practice. If you do five minutes of meditation, it's can be of profound benefit and significance in your life. Even just a moment, the Buddha said, if you cultivate a wholesome mind, a pure mind, for just a moment, it has immeasurable benefit. So we should be encouraged by this in our practice and in our study. So thank you all for tuning in. I wish you all good practice and good study, study that leads to practice. And may you all be well. Thank you.